answer some of those questions that we so often do as we look at these books and uh, the who, what, when, where, why questions. Uh, And so at the outset, you can guess uh, this book was written by a man named Ezekiel. Right? There's, there's no dispute, no, no question there. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, um, starting in verse 1, we'll just read the first three verses here. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Kiber Canal, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Kiver Canal, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. We learned a lot right in those first three verses about what's happening and about when it's happening. So we see Ezekiel is is both a priest and a prophet, right? And so God is going to speak to his people through this man, Ezekiel. We know We don't know a lot about him. Uh, In fact, this is the only book that he has mentioned in the entirety of Scripture. His name means strengthened by God. And it's certainly appropriate for the ministry that God has called him to. Uh, He is far from an ordinary man. Uh, (laughs) uh, W.F. Albright writes, he describes Ezekiel as one of the greatest spiritual figures of all time in spite of his tendency to psychic abnormality. Right? And so uh, it was about uh, 60 years ago, someone tried to do what they called a Freudian analysis on Ezekiel. Right? Now, that's, that's difficult to do right? when you're sitting across a desk from someone, let alone someone who lived 3,000 years ago. Right? And so we'll take that with a grain of salt. But the conclusion was this. They labeled Ezekiel a true psychotic. <laughs> Right, so that, that gives you some insight into uh, some, of the, some of the things that you'll see from this man. They seem insane. The reason, the reason why these things seem so strange and why Ezekiel does it is because the Lord tells him to do it. God's going to call Ezekiel to do some things that seem outright crazy, <laughs> strange, ridiculous, and <laughs> all of it. To, to bring forth God's message, to speak God's truth. And Ezekiel is going gonna to receive visions, uh, prophecies, and God's going to encourage him to make those known through very vivid object lessons. Some of the things that we see Ezekiel doing in the book, he lay on his left side for over a year. Right? For over one year, he just lay on his left side, and it was, it was, it was, it was an object lesson to the nation of the nation of Israel and into their in a judgment on their it was for every year that they had lived in the land in rebellion and then after that year was up those 390 days actually uh, he had him turn over on his right side for 40 days uh, representing the nation of Judah uh, he was actually bound by rope in his home unable to speak uh, and so th- th- there's some unique situations. In one, uh, in one chapter, you see Ezekiel take a sword and shave his head and his beard. And then God tells him to take the hair and to divide it into portions and to do certain things with his hair, all as an illustration of what God was going to do with his people. So you can see why people would look at Ezekiel and say, this man's a little, a little crazy, Right? I mean, he does some things that are, he's going to make a little model of the city and, 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 show, and kind of display what God's going to do and kind of hover this sword over top of it, uh, displaying God's judgment and, and, and how Babylon's going to besiege the city. Uh, so uh, things that seem a little unusual, right? And, and, and there's many more. We could go on and on. Uh, he's a unique man, but a man who was obedient to the Lord. I see this man Ezekiel and I see the things that God has called him to do and I ask myself the question, would I be willing to obey? Would I be willing to do what, knowing that, I mean, we're, we're afraid to share the gospel with someone because we're, we're worried about what someone would think. And yet, here's a man who knowing the people are not going to respond 
God's, called, God's already told him they're not going to respond, yet he's willing to obey and to do these outlandish things all in obedience to the Lord. And it's going to cost him greatly. And we'll see that later on. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, as far as the when and the where, again, this is, we're, within, we're in the Babylonian captivity. And, and it's likely that Ezekiel would have been part of the first large group that was brought out of exile. You remember, you know, the, the city of Israel was attacked. And then a few years later, they came back because the king tried to, you know, tried to do some things, and, and Babylon didn't like it, so they just come and they took the city all together, and they took 10,000 exiles out of Israel, and Ezekiel was among those exiles. Right, so he would have been working at the same time, a prophet at the same time, as Jeremiah. Right, Jeremiah stayed back in Jerusalem. Ezekiel went to Babylon. He would have been in Babylon at the same time as Daniel. In fact, uh, he's going to mention Daniel in chapter 14 and chapter 20. All right, so they were, they were ministering about the same time. Um, and so this would have been, uh, Isaiah's, or Ezekiel's ministry would have started around 592 and would have went to about 570 B.C. Right? So he ministered, prophesied for 22 years to the nation of Israel during the 70 years of captivity. So that gives you an idea of the time frame in which he was, he was about 30 years old. That's what you saw there in, 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 chat, in verse 1 in the 30th year. We're talking about his age, uh, not the 30th year of captivity. We'll see that as we get deeper into the book. Um, and so we have the, the Babylonians invading Jerusalem. And it's five years into that captivity that Ezekiel receives a vision from the Lord. So five years in captivity, they've heard Almost nothing. In fact, the picture is of Ezekiel <laughs> sitting along the, the banks of the Kibar and just kind of looking longingly towards Jerusalem, towards home. And God appears in a vision. All right, so the what and the why. As far as an outline of the book, uh, really you can divide it into two sections, two segments. Uh, in chapters 1 through 32, it's prophecies concerning condemnation, concerning judgment, right? God's going to judge his people, right? That's going to be through this captivity. And he's going to not only, ex he's going to explain the judgment, explain why the judgment is happening in very vivid terms. And, and, and really, the emphasis over those first, the first half of the book is, the Lord is not there. The Lord is not there, right? Speaking of Jerusalem, the promised land. And then there's a Transi transition chapter in chapter 33 where the people have an opportunity to repent. God's calling them to repentance. And then chapters 30, 33 or 34 through 48, we see prophecies of consolation, right? Or hope. So we see judgment, but then we see hope. And so the first half, the Lord is not there. The second half, the Lord is there. Right? And we could break that down further. Those first three chapters dealing with Ezekiel's call to ministry. And then in chapters 4 through 24, we have the outline concerning Judah's judgment. And he's going to deal specifically with the nation of Judah. You know, what happened, what led up to their judgment, and how it's going to take place. And then in chapters 25 to 32, we see a judgment of the nation surrounding Israel. Right? They're, they're, they're not going to escape. All of these nations that Israel has integrated with and adopted their foreign practices, God's going to judge them as well. And then in the second half of the book, in chapters 34 to 37, we see the restoration of Israel. There's the hope, right? In chapters 38 and 39, the removal of Israel's enemies. And then lastly, in chapters 40 through 48, a vision of the new temple. The new temple. Now, um, I, I've got a lot of feedback from you on these Sunday night overviews, and, and, and you have said you really like the videos we've been showing. So we're going to do that again tonight. This one's a little longer uh, than the ones. It's about seven minutes, and so I, I don't always like to do that, um, to take that length of time. But uh, <laughs> one of my elders said, I learned more about Lamentations in five minutes than I have my whole life through that video. So I think that's helpful, and it paints a visual for you. And so we're going to go ahead and play that. Uh, again, this is part one. If you want to watch part two, then you can do that on your own time later on. But part one, overview of Ezekiel. The book of the prophet Ezekiel 
Ezekiel was a priest who had been living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack on the city. And they spared the city, but they took a first wave of Israelite prisoners and hauled them off into exile, and Ezekiel was among them. So the book begins five years after all that, and Ezekiel is sitting on the bank of an irrigation canal near his Israelite refugee camp, and it's his 30th birthday, no less, the year that he would have been installed as a priest in Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel has this vision. He sees a storm cloud approaching, and then inside the cloud are four strange creatures that have wings outstretched and touching each other. And these creatures each had four faces. And then he saw four wheels, one by each creature. And then he saw that the wings of the creatures were supporting this dazzling platform. And then on that platform is a throne. And then sitting on that throne is this human-like creature glowing and shrouded in fire. And then then all of a sudden Ezekiel realizes what he's seeing. He calls it the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. It's God riding his royal throne chariot. Now the word glory, in Hebrew it's kavod, it means heavy or significant. The biblical authors use this word to describe the physical appearance and manifestation of God's significance when he shows up in person. These images in the vision, they're very similar to what happened when God appeared on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. And it's also very similar to the depictions of God's presence over the Ark of the Covenant. And that's actually the most shocking thing about Ezekiel's vision. What is God's glory doing in Babylon? It's supposed to be above the Ark of the Covenant, in the temple in Jerusalem. And so the first section of the book opens to explore that question as Ezekiel begins to accuse Israel of rebellion. So God first speaks to Ezekiel from the throne chariot and he commissions him as a prophet. Ezekiel is to accuse Israel of breaking their covenant agreement with God in a couple ways. Israel has given their allegiance to other gods and has been worshiping idols and this has all led to rampant social injustice and violence. And so as a result, God appoints Ezekiel to warn the people. The first Babylonian attack that took Ezekiel into exile is going to be matched by another. And Jerusalem, its temple, all face imminent destruction. So Ezekiel uses words and more to get his message across. He also performs sign acts. These were a form of street theater. Ezekiel would go out in public and start behaving in these really bizarre ways that were like parables of his prophetic message. So he was supposed to build a tiny model of Jerusalem and then stage an attack on it. Or he was to shave off all of his hair and then chop it up with a sword. Or the most extreme, he was to play the role of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. And he would lay on his side for over a year eating food cooked over poop as a sign of the nasty food that people will have to eat during the siege of Jerusalem. And perhaps the most disheartening thing of all is the bad news God gave Ezekiel that no one was going to listen to him. Israel would reject him because of their rebellious and hard heart. And this recalls Moses' description of the people after the wilderness rebellions, when he predicted that exile would one day happen, and Ezekiel had the unfortunate privilege of seeing it all come to pass. And so a dismayed Ezekiel, he begins to perform his task. And after about a year, he has another vision. This one is about the temple. He goes on this virtual tour of the temple and he sees what's happening there in his absence and it is not good. In the outer courtyard in front of the temple, he sees this large idol statue. And then he sees the elders of Israel worshiping other gods, both outside and inside the temple. And then he sees the women of Israel. They're worshiping a Babylonian god named Tammuz. And the vision ends with God's glorious throne chariot moving up and away from the temple. It's leaving, going east, headed towards Babylon. And so in chapter 11, we come to see why and how God's glory appeared to Ezekiel there in Babylon. Israel's idolatry and their covenant violations, it's become so blatant and offensive that God has left his temple. They've driven him away and he consigns it to destruction. But God hasn't abandoned his people. Rather, he goes into exile with them. And so at the end of this vision in chapter 11, God promises that he will return a remnant of Israel back to the land and he'll transform them by removing their heart of stone and giving them a new soft heart of flesh so that they can love and truly follow their God after all. This is a small glimmer of hope and it's quickly submerged under the reality of the imminent destruction. 
But chapter 11, it's a key transition, and it helps us understand how the rest of the book has been designed. So the next three sections are all announcements of God's judgment, first on Israel, then on the nations around Israel, and then on Jerusalem itself. But then after that, the hopeful conclusion of chapter 11 gets developed in the final three sections of the book. First, hope for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all creation. Chapters 12 through 24 focus on God's judgment coming to Israel. And this is a diverse collection of poems and essays. And here Ezekiel shows his fondness for parable and allegory. So he depicts Israel as a burnt, useless stick or as a rebellious wife, or as a dangerous raging lion that gets captured, or as two promiscuous sisters. These are all depictions of Israel's senseless rebellion and idolatry that results in their ruin. In this section, Ezekiel also acts like a lawyer. He begins arguing the case that, first of all, Jerusalem's destruction is truly deserved after centuries of covenant violation. And that even if the most righteous people in the world, like Noah or Daniel or Job, were alive and praying for God to spare Israel, God would not accept their prayers. It's far too late. And so God's goodness actually demands that he bring justice on this generation of Israel. The exile has become inevitable. They've reached the point of no return. Following this, Ezekiel focuses first on the nations immediately around Israel, and then on the two most powerful states in the region, Egypt and then Tyre. Israel has allied with these nations and adopted their gods and their idols. And so God accuses the kings of Tyre and Egypt for arrogantly viewing themselves as gods who get to define right and wrong on their own terms. And God holds these kings accountable for their pride and he announces that he will use Babylon to bring them down. They will face God's justice along with everybody else. Following these really intense sections is a short story in chapter 33. Ezekiel's met by a refugee who's just arrived from Jerusalem, and he gives them the report that Babylon has attacked the city of Jerusalem, that the city has fallen, and the temple is destroyed. Ezekiel's grim warnings have become a reality. But remember, the end of chapter 11, that's not the end of the story. And so in the next video, we'll explore Ezekiel's profound vision of hope. But for now, that's the first half of the book of Ezekiel. All right, so that's part one. You can watch part two on your own. They're available uh, on YouTube through the Bible Project. But you get a, a picture uh, of this book and how it's made up and, and certainly a, a picture of God's judgment for the sin and idolatry of the nation of Israel. What I want, what I want to do quickly is, is go back to Ezekiel chapter 1. <clears throat> And, and you saw that image, I mean, when you think of the book of Ezekiel, you probably just think of songs, right? You think of, uh, of, of, of dry bones, and you think of Ezekiel saw the wheel, you know, the wheel way up in the middle of the air, and, and those are the things you probably remember. Uh, but that, that imagery, that picture of, of the wheel and the throne, it, Ezekiel gets a glimpse of the glory of God, much like Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai. Uh, much like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 in the throne room. Uh, but here, he's outside. He's outside the nation, outside of the promised land. And he gets this vision, this glimpse of God's glory. We see it um, at the end of chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 26. And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain. So it was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Right. And, and so we have a picture, very similar to a picture we see in Revelation, of the throne room of God. And Ezekiel gets this glimpse, and it literally floors him, right? This is what happens when you get a glimpse of God's glory. You begin to see him for who he is. He just falls on his face, and he hears God speaking, and God's going to call him. Notice Verse 1 of chapter 2, he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, right? 
and I will speak with you. And he refers to Ezekiel over 90 times as the son of man in the book, reminding him of his humanity. And as he spoke to me, the spirit entered to me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Right? So God not only called him, but enabled him by his spirit to accomplish. Remember, strengthened by God. God, whatever God calls you to do, he equips you to do. And so he's going to send Ezekiel to do some, some pretty bizarre things, pronouncing his judgment. And notice verse 7 of chapter 2. Or I'm sorry, of chapter 3 in verse 7. But the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you. For they are not willing to listen to me because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. So Ezekiel, I'm going to send you as a prophet to my people. I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you to proclaim, you know, turn from your sin, repent, or face judgment. But they are not going to listen. They're not going to listen. And then in, in chapters 5 through 6, we see the purpose of the judgment. The point it really, probably chapters 5 through 7, and I'm just going to point these out. Uh, we don't have time to read these chapters, but in, in verse 11 of chapter 5, or I'm sorry, verse 13, it says, Thus shall my anger spend itself, and I will vent my fury upon them, and satisfy myself, and they shall know that I am the Lord, that I have spoken in my jealousy when I spend my fury upon them. Right? The purpose behind the judgment is what? To remind them of who he is. I am the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh. I am that I am. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who rescued and saved you. Not these false foreign idols that you have been worshiping. They shall know, again in verse 15, I am the Lord, I have spoken. And again in verse 17, I am the Lord, I have spoken. In chapter 6 and verse 10, they shall know that I am the Lord. Again in verse 13, you shall know that I am the Lord. In chapter 7, in verse 4, then you will know that I am the Lord. And in verse 9, then you will know that I am the Lord. And at the end of chapter 7, in verse 27, and they shall know that I am the Lord. You get the picture, right? Over and over, the, the purpose behind these objects, these illustrations in the judgment of God is what? I am God. I am the Lord. I'm the one who rescued. I'm the one who saved you. I'm the one who brought you into this land. And then from chapters 8 through 11, we see that picture that was portrayed there in the video. The glory of God leaving Israel and going towards Babylon. What a... They, 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 they reveled in the idea that the glory of God was in Israel. Jerusalem. It was in Israel. And yet here, the glory of God leaves. The temple is destroyed. But we're not left without hope. Right there at the end of chapter 11, we see that picture of the new covenant. In verse 19, it says, I will give them one heart and a new spirit. I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. God's not going to leave them without a remnant. Right? He's going to send them back to the promised land. He's going, to, he's going to make them new, that they may be the people that God has called them to be. Now, chapters 12 through 24, uh, they're, they're a, there's some vivid, vivid imagery there of what brings about judgment. Particularly chapter 16 and chapter 23, I would... I would say are probably rated R type chapters. Um, we're not going to read through those tonight. But I, I told you the cost of Ezekiel's ministry was great. None greater than in chapter 24. So if you want to turn with me very quickly, we, we see a heartbreaking lesson that costs Ezekiel as he demonstrates God's judgment on his people. Look at verse 15 of chapter 24. The word of the Lord came to me Son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban, put your shoes on your feet. Do not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. 
So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening, my wife died. And on the next morning, I did as I was commanded. To, to follow the Lord in obedience cost Ezekiel, his, his wife, the delight of his eyes. You say, why, why would God do that? And it was, a, again, a, a very vivid illustration to the people of Israel that they were going to lose the delight of their eyes, which was the, the city of Jerusalem. They had come to delight in the gift more than the giver of the gift. And again, the picture, why did God do that? Verse 24, thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign according to all that he has done. You shall do when this comes, then you will know that I am the Lord God. They would know that he was God. We see that judgment of the nations in chapters 25 to 32, and then the call to repentance in chapter 33. We're just going to briefly look at a few verses there. Chapter 33 and verse 11, the Lord tells Ezekiel, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? But they would not turn. They, they, they went on in their rebellion in the city of Jerusalem. It struck down. We see that man coming from Jerusalem to Babylon, giving news to Ezekiel that the city has fallen and the temple is destroyed at the end of chapter 33. And then we begin to move. Into, uh, everything at this point is just dismal. We see the, the idolatry and the sin and the rebellion and God's judgment. And then... Moving on from chapter 34, we begin to see hope. As, as God reveals the restoration of his people in this new covenant in chapter 36. We actually looked at that this morning. So I'm not going to retrace that. God giving his people a new heart and a new spirit. And, and that, that, that picture in chapter 37 that we're so familiar with, the valley of the dry bones, right? And just the, the spirit of God giving new life. Uh, literally taking dead bones and giving them flesh. And, and it's a picture of what? It's a picture going all the way back to, to, to Genesis and, and God creating man out of the dust of the earth. And he takes these dead, dry bones and, it's, and, and he gives them life. He's restoring, restoring his creation. And this is, this is where history is moving. And, and then, again, chapter 38 and 39 is the destruction of his enemies. And chapter 40 through uh, 48 is the vision of a new temple. In chapter 47, we see that picture of the, the river flowing out from underneath the altar. And as that river goes forth, it's just bringing forth life. It's restoring the, the, the seas and the oceans to fresh water. And all around the river, there is life growing. There's, there's trees and life. And, and it's a picture of, of, a, of almost an Edenic type of garden growing, God restoring his creation back to what it was meant to be. This is what we have to look forward to in that millennial kingdom. Ultimately, chapter 48, the very end, and I wish we had more time to look at this in detail, but in verse 35, it says the, the circumference of the city shall be 18,000 cubits. Now, they just went and kind of <laughs> diagrammed the entire promised land. It's bigger than it ever has been. Right? God's going to give them all that he intended in the Abrahamic covenant. But then it says the name of the city from that time on shall be the Lord is there. Yahweh Shammah. <laughs> right? So we saw what? God's glory removed from the temple, the temple destroyed, the presence of the Lord gone, and now we see the, the presence of God restored. The Lord is there, and they will never again be removed from his presence. This is key and significant to the book as a whole, is the presence of God and the joy and the life that we find in there. So we always say, you know, these books are pointing forward to the person and work of Christ. There's, there's numerous allusions throughout the book, but the reality is Jesus is, is portrayed as the greater priest who intercedes on behalf of his people. Uh, he's the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. You know, the, the, sheep the, the priest, the, the shepherds of the people failed. 
They failed miserably to, to do what God had called them to do, but Jesus fulfilled that ministry, and, and he's the greater temple that brings us into the presence of God. Right? Again, that presence being significant. We see, we see in Christ, right, Emmanuel, God with us. In a very unique way, God entering into our presence, making it possible for us to enter into his, tearing the veil, right? And so we see how God makes this relationship possible. And, and just in conclusion, you know, what, what do we learn from this book? And it's, it's vast and it's large and there's a lot in there, but it, Ezekiel reveals to us the glory and the majesty of God. As you're reading it, you can't help but see his holiness and his justice uh, you can't help but, but see his grace and his mercy for his people, his, his sovereignty over all creation as all of history is moving towards its ultimate fulfillment in him. We, we, we see that through this book as God is restoring all things to himself. One of the things the book of Ezekiel should cause you to do is to, is to search your heart and to deal with sin swiftly. We know that whom the Lord loves, he chastens, right? And, and so for us to walk in sin and rebellion <laughs> leads, to, leads to ruin, and leads to disaster, right? We see how jealous our God is. And so for us to walk in idolatry is, is both foolish and dangerous and destructive for our life. Uh, this is why in 1 John chapter 5, and verse 21, you know, finishing out the, the book, the Apostle John says, my, my little children, keep yourselves from idols. John Calvin said our, our hearts are idol-making factories. And the reality is, even as we sit here tonight as God's people, there's competing idols. You know, Israel here was dwelling in the promised land, and yet there were, there were idols competing for their attention. And they were turning their heart from the Lord and to these idols. And that danger is ever present for you and I. Those things that we set up and that we put a higher priority on than God himself. So search. Search your heart. Ask you, you know, what in my life is, is more significant, more important to me than him? Nothing, nothing should stand in his place. No one should stand in his place. He alone is worthy of, of all honor and glory and praise. We're reminded that no matter how bad things get, and things are bad here in Ezekiel, right? Hopeless. No matter how bad things get, God is in control, and he's present with his people. And we, we get a beautiful picture. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Even though they were removed from Jerusalem and in captivity in Babylon, God did not abandon his people. He met them where they're In fact, even then, he was moving to accomplish his purposes. Oh, how we need to be reminded of that. And, and we see the effects of sin and the, the seeming direction of our nation. And yet what? God is in control. He's in complete control. Yet we see God working among the nations here in Ezekiel. And we're reminded that he is working today. And he has the ability to bring about restoration if he so chooses. There's hope. There's hope in him. Above all, we're reminded that our life is in God. That our deepest need is to live in relationship to him. Our greatest joy and satisfaction is found in his presence. Right, Psalm 1611, it says, you, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. We were created to walk with him. We were created to be in relationship with this God. And when we do so, we find satisfaction and joy and life. But when we are outside of his presence, when we're walking in rebellion and sin, we find ruin and, and destruction and dissatisfaction. <laughs> the greatest need you have tonight is to be in a relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. And if you do not have that relationship, I would plead with you to turn from your sin and trust in Christ. 
But even as his people who know him, there's this danger, is there not? <laughs> we sing it, come thou fount, prone to wander. <laughs> Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. <laughs> Here's my heart. <laughs> Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy course above. There, there's this danger ever present to, to wander, to, to walk towards the things of this world and to miss out in the joy and the delights and the beauty of living in fellowship with God. Search your heart tonight. See if there be any wicked way in you, anything that would hinder your, your walk and your fellowship with the Lord. And we're going to close in prayer tonight.